Good day, beautiful people. Greet you in a wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And yes, we continue with Isaiah chapter 29. I'm just going to skip immediately to the last verse, verse 24. And they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. And I am grateful for my little wife who actually pointed out that murmuring is not part of um, the seasons according to um, what we read in Ecclesiastics chapter 3. But that's not the point. We need to focus on that all that murmured shall learn doctrines. So there's a change. So if we read Isaiah and if we understand, when we understand it and we understand the way that God works, we understand that we have a way that we pray, that we have a way that we intercede, how we sp speak the word of God. And that is important because what you speak do really have meaning. And we need to be careful for that. And I am emphasizing that the whole here chapter 29 is first of all the first part goes about is about impeding discipline we talk a lot about discipline this year god's righteousness but then from chapter uh, from verse 17 onward it is about the blessing after deliverance so you need to understand and read the word of god clearly i'm going to go all sunday school today um, a basic verse, and we're going to focus on Isaiah 29, verse 13 to 16, because that is the typical thing that we read, and we don't read the other stuff, because that's too complicated. Um, I still want to focus on verse 4, which says, And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust um, for those who have ears to listen listen to these words and these scriptures understand and read the bible carefully um, because this bible study is not for the faint of heart so we're going to continue on Isaiah 29 verse 13 to 16 and it says wherefore the lord saith for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me as taught by the precept of men and therefore behold i will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? Be careful. God knows everything. Surely your, your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, He made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him, that framed it. He has no understanding. What does it mean for us today? And how do we apply this? Remember, this Bible study is about understanding God. And we have three years now. I'm going to talk about it a bit later on. But we have three main principles in the past three years. And this year is about understanding God and his way of his deliverance and the way that God works so that the meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the holy of Israel. So before going further, let's have a little talk about um, where this passage of the Bible occurs both historically as well as in context. Um, the book of Isaiah in the Bible occurs about around 700 before Christ and before and during a serious invasion of Israel it is divided into 66 chapters that's why I said this is a long book a bit of a study so the first part, part chapter 1 to 39 deal with God's character and judgment and we talked about that one as well 
um, where we s try to find out our place, our our identity within Christ. Chapter 40 to 66 deal with comfort and redemption. And this chapter, Isaiah 29, um, is part of a section of six chapters called the Six Woes. So Isaiah 28 to 33. So chapter 29 is addressing Jerusalem. So in the Old Testament, Jerusalem was the center of God's chosen people. And today, Christians should listen with care to the instructions God gave to Jerusalem. And this isn't just outdated. A lot of people nowadays say, it's outdated. We don't read this. We don't understand it the way that you, you read. Yeah. But it has direct relevance today. And we see it. We see how God works. Love, uh, love God personally. What is love? If we read Isaiah 13 to 16, um, looking at this passage, it describes the opposite of what we should do. Understand this really well. It is the opposite of what we should do. Drawing near to God with words and honoring God with lip service, removing our hearts far from God, having a reverence for God or fear of God, as other translations said, that consists of traditional learned by rote or taught by men. Be careful what you have been taught. I always say, forget everything that you've read and try to hear what God is actually saying. With a good list of things not to do, what do we do now? And what does the right thing look like? So what do we do about lip service? Like I said, this, back to Sunday school. Lip service. The exact phrase, with their mouth. Um, we can read that back in Psalm 78 verse 36, which reads, by they, But they flattered him with their mouth and lied to him, God, with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast toward him, nor were they faithful with his covenant. Mm. From the Psalm, the opposite of flattering merely with our mouths, our praying lip service, might be having a steadfast heart toward God or being faithful with his covenant. And practically, both of those boil down to believe. Do I really believe God? Or do I merely know what he has said? Do I believe God or do I merely know what he has said without actually believing it? When I reference belief here, I'm talking about internal understanding that drives trust and action. To drive trust and action. For example, there are people who know that planes are safe forms of transportation, but don't believe it. And although they may fly because of their knowledge, they are fearful the whole time because of what they believe. I think belief may be an act of will. And when it comes to knowledge, I happily act as if it is something I control. I can choose to learn, study, research, or I cannot. But when it comes to belief, I act as if it just has to happen to me externally through the sheer weight of accumulated knowledge or com just come directly from God. Belief is similar to love. It is emotional and it does come externally, but it isn't just those things. Loving well requires a will and a decision, a will and your decision. What is love? For example, you cannot love your spouse well if you only care for them on the days where you are brimming with affection for them. There are thousands of books, essays, conferences, speeches, articles, counseling sessions addressing the necessity of choice and the will in love. But belief is certainly in my life, but also it seems in the lives of many other Christians to be considered categorized under things that are out of my control. And we talk about God is always in control. So why do you say it's out of your control? Belief often requires a will. And I don't think Peter was just overcome with the emotion of belief when he stepped out on the water to join Jesus and then ran out of belief, just 
a belief juice, I think it required willpower to step out. Willpower. I want to be careful here to clarify that I'm not saying that you can make anything, anything happen that you will by just speaking words. That's witchcraft. Be careful. We cannot do that. We need to stay in the will of God. But I'm saying that you have to work to believe and you have to make a decision to believe. So there's a risk. And you only have to look around at acquaintances, your co-workers, family members, friends, to see that people can make the decisions to believe all sorts of crazy things. And when you choose what to believe, you need to be careful. Believe God. Read what the Bible says. Pray. Intercede. And then decide to believe that. Don't just believe leader X, pastor Y, inspirational speaker Z, or even a logical argument A. I'm good at that. And I understand how it works. We have a book here on the paradoxes, understanding paradoxes and working with that within metaverse and within totalitarianism. And in the meanwhile, while you are making decisions to believe, don't claim to believe what you don't. Doing that may require to look less Christian. And if that idea concerns or offends you, initially that me, that may be a sign that tradition and appearances are more important to you than honesty. What is honesty? So what do we do about it? Distant hearts? And to answer to distant heart, hearts is a lot simpler on the face of it and draw our hearts near to God. How do we pray? How do we intercede? Before we can change the location of our hearts, we need to find out where they are. Where's the location of your heart? Matthew 6 verse 90 to 21, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where the thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Understand this concept and this law. Consider what, you tr what is your treasure. Where do you spend your time, your money, your thoughts, your emotions? I'm a, I'm a very imaginative person. So for me, a big part of this is how I spend my imagination. I use my thoughts. My, I think a lot. Where do I spend my imagination, my time? What is the result of that? And I discover that I spend a lot of time winning arguments I had lost. Or I would even manufacture arguments where I said brilliantly cutting things that shut my antagonist down. I'm trained for this. So this revealed a lot about my having a very high self-regard and frankly coward, well actually cowardless and meanness as well. I've spent time praying about this habit and I've committed to shutting those imaginative scenes down. That is still an occasion tendency I work against, but it is less frequent or immediate because God is doing a change. So if it is some way it should not be, choose to treasure something else and spend your time, your effort, your money to train yourself. And Paul says to Philippians 4 verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is comfortable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So does a simple and blunt assessment of these kinds of entertainment you engage in or consume align with that? Some of my entertainment does, but honestly, a lot. If none, does not. So what do we do about it? Commandment of men? How do we avoid our faith being just the commandment of men that is taught? Two things. Change how we ingest learning. And two, seek the Holy Spirit. Again, verse 24 from chapter 29, Isaiah. They also, they also that erred in spirit 
shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. James 1 verse 22 reads, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not just hearers who deceive themselves. Verse 25, But one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer. And this person will be blessed on what he does. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1 to 3 says, Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes one conceited, but love edifies. Love edifies. How beautiful. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, is known by him. So we need to seek the Holy Spirit, pursuing our relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. And seeking the Holy Spirit requires being willing to see him. Part of that, which is welcoming miracles instead of explaining them. When a prayer is answered, accept and believe that it is miraculous instead of considering it coincidence or not miraculous. If you can identify a natural cause God created this world and he loves it and it is reasonable for him to use the natural mechanisms he designed to accomplish his will. And I think this is both a warning and a gift. The warning, if we rely on learning taught by teachers, we will be betrayed. This is not God being mean. It's how things function. If I use an umbrella as a parachute, I'm going to be disappointed. If I rely on something that is not designed for and it is incapable of holding that trust, then my trust will be betrayed. It's how things work. It's just how things work. And we need to seek the Holy Spirit and rely on Him. So the gift, we, don't, we won't be left to rely on unreliable things. Depend on God. And this is what we talk about this year, is depending on God, understanding God's plans. And we need to rely on God for our plans and not hide our plans from God. Isaiah 29 verse 15 reads, Woe those to those who de deeply hide their plans from the Lord and whose deeds are in a dark place. And they say, who sees us? Who knows us? So the first few times I read this passage, I misread it, actually. Isaiah 29, 15 actually says, Whose deeds are done in a dark place? But the meaning that I read was, Who do dark deeds? What a difference. So the focus is on the, hid, the hiddenness of the deeds, not the goodness or badness of the deeds. And this felt like some significant revelation for me, and this is a long video, but as I thought more about it, that distinction is a bit nonsense, frankly. The distinction would be significant if it is possible to do God good th deeds in a dark place. But considering that you can do good things hidden from or apart from God is foolishness. And there is such things as good apart from God, because God is good. I don't think that my tendency to believe that I can do good on my own is unique to me. I think this is common in our society. So what do we do about it? Deeds in a dark place? Solution is depending on God. And this is our message this year. Understanding God's plan from a prophetic point of view and from a point of view where you understand, read God's word. Dependence is not something that we all ideo ideologically try to do, although practically we are awash in our dependence on other things and people. And so this may feel like a very large task, but partly it is. But it isn't binary, and it isn't a binary switch of dependence or independence. You can't switch between the two. We can take actions to grow, grow our independence and our dependence on God. Spend time talking to him, praying, reading his word. And as we make plans, talk to God about them and hold them loosely when we do. Don't just tell God our plans after we have made them. 
but talk to God about our plans as we're considering them and ask for his guidance. And all of this requires submitting to God. And this is the message for today is where we submit to God, to his ways, to his plans, because we know that they are true. Submit to God and you, Isaiah 20. 9 verse 16 says you turn around shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay that what is made would say to its maker he did not make me or what is formed say to him who formed it he has no understanding read your bible understand what god is saying today and understand that it will be turned around and you need to submit to god may your day be blessed amen